goddesses and the gods, especially the non asshole gods. <laughs> <laughs> the gods who are, who don't see women as like property to just bless this gathering. And I wanted to thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just gonna launch into my little my little spiel here and feel free to ask questions or stop me if you can't understand something or if you need me to repeat it. Um, this is part of my effort to kind of like learn how to do public speaking. It's a lot easier to do it with friends who have had a few glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> At conferences, everyone's sober, and you're like, <laughs> you're trying to crack a joke, <laughs> and then it bombs. And like, oh, okay, all right. This is the first in a series of lectures entitled "Why You Need a New Religion." This lecture series is part of my work with the Disco Liberation Movement, a new religion of freedom and peace. I am starting this new religion because I believe that our old patriarchal religions are not only no longer serving us, but they are hampering our progress and keeping us stuck in the dark ages of misogyny, warfare, hatred, and intolerance. The DLM is a religion based on freedom and peace and dancing. My view is that a strong daily dancing practice is a very good way for people to have a spiritual and meditative practice that is easier than sitting meditation, which is not everybody's cup of tea. But everyone can dance, and everyone loves music. Music and dancing are a form of magic that liberate us from the confines of social mental structures, and we must liberate our minds from eons of patriarchal indoctrination so we can all become peaceful and freedom-loving people. You can find more information about the DLM and sign up to receive my weekly disco sermons on the website. I'll pass out the literature later. <laughs> the lecture series is about religion, since it is our religions that determine our psychological and spiritual and social attitudes. If we have a religion that sanctions warfare and misogyny, guess what? Our society will reflect violence and an ongoing hatred of women. So in these lectures, I want to examine the influence of the three main Semitic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, to see what kind of influence they have had on us. I will begin by examining ancient history and past religions, and with each lecture going forward, I will get more into the specific examples of how our main religions are devastating our species and helping to maintain conflicts, wars, and tremendous suffering all across the globe. It's not always immediately apparent, nor do we as average people going about our daily lives necessarily stop to consider this sort of thing. But the religions we practice end up defining and organizing the way we set up society and its laws and its practices. Religion, therefore, becomes an ideological tool with which people in leadership roles control society and keep it functioning according to the prerogatives of the day. To me, one of the most striking aspects of our top three religions is the inherent misogyny in them. The constant woman hating and woman bashing, which has yielded a world in which women are treated as inferior. This idea that women are inferior is so deeply ingrained that even countless women believe it. Even in so-called advanced Western societies, this is still the case. Numerous passages in the holy books assert the supremacy of the masculine gender while denigrating the female gender. The rape, murder, ownership, enslavement, and unjust killings of women and girls are consistently sanctioned by Yahweh, the Lord our Father, or by Allah in these apparently holy books. The most famous of these woman bashing political power grab and economic expedient masquerading as religion stories is of course the Adam and Eve story, which I'll discuss in a little while. But the point to grasp here is that a vehement hatred of women and an equally vehement insistence on the supremacy of the masculine God and the men who were created in his image permeates the written texts that uphold these religions. And these are the same books that even today in courts of law we must lay our hands upon when we swear an oath to tell the truth. 
Our top two religions, all of which hail from the same, same source, are mainly recognizable for their angry, unforgiving, vengeful, masculine God who endorses misogyny, slavery, racism, and the domination of others through the use of violent force. It's not so surprising, therefore, to see a world in which this domination of others through the use of violent force seems to be the highest priority. No matter where you look, more and more advanced weapons for killing are being developed and manufactured and sold. There are so many armed conflicts raging the world that we have become entirely desensitized to it. But all this warfare and murder has its origins in these outdated religious perspectives that we have inherited from the distant past. Historically, our religions derive from Indo-European tribes who, a few thousand years before the advent of Judaism and later Christianity, worshipped an angry masculine sky god of thunder and mountains, whose sacred images included weapons such as the sword, the spear, and the knife. This same unreasonable and vengeful sky god later on evolved into Zeus, and his weapon became a thunderbolt. And a little later, he became the entirely psychotic god of the Old Testament, known as Yahweh or Jehovah. For the men of these early Hebrew and Indo-European tribes, power was defined by the ability to kill and control and dominate. The supremacy of masculinity and masculine values, and the fact that their god was male, naturally meant that women would hold an inferior position and were thus subject to the rule of men in all things. Starting to sound familiar. But our world was not always dominated by these men and their crazy sky god. Many thousands of years ago, the earth was populated by highly advanced civilizations, matrilineal societies that ardently worshipped a female deity, which is to say, God as everyone knew it then was a woman, not a man. She was a goddess. During Paleolithic times, which go back as far as 30,000 years, and later during Neolithic times, about 10,000 years ago, and in areas as diverse and far apart as the Middle East, Europe, Russia, China, and even Ireland, Scotland, and England, evidence of goddess-worshipping religions and cultures has been found and archaeologically established. In these societies, too, their religion, the worship of the goddess, defined and organized the way society was structured. So instead of being angry, wrathful, and bloodthirsty, the goddess embodied the spirit of a loving mother who was the creatrix of all nature. She represented the mysteries of birth, death, and rebirth in both the natural world and in the lives of humans. The societies that formed around the worship of the goddess saw the veneration and cultivation of life as the highest value. In these societies, Peaceful cooperation between men and women is evident from archaeological findings. For example, no weapons are found, no images valorizing war and domination are found, nothing found in the burial sites to suggest a hierarchical system of domination by chieftains or kings. Instead, the archaeologi archaeological evidence points to a society that venerated and cultivated nature for these were the earliest agrarian societies, farmers and horticulturalists, basically, who nurtured plants and trees and gardens and worshiped the compassionate and loving deity. Especially notable is the perfect egalitarian equality and cooperation between men and women in these civilizations. The femaleness of the goddess made sure that women and girls had a high position in society since femininity was not systematically attacked and belittled. There is overwhelming archaeological evidence that shows the existence of courts of law and female magistrates, lawyers, and judges, complex religious practices overseen by women priestesses, economic vitality through the production and trade of goods overseen by women. In fact, it's almost universally agreed upon that women invented agriculture. Also, a number of pre-Sumerian goddess traditions are credited with the invention of writing and the written word, not to mention beautiful and highly advanced expressions of art in pottery, basket weaving, and sculptures, but also of religious and iconic art. There is evidence also of women seers and priestesses in possession of divine wisdom and knowledge, women who were also clearly trained in the physicians and healing arts. 
All of this points at healthy, strong, mentally and intellectually advanced women in charge of maintaining and cultivating peaceful societies. This evidence contrasts sharply with what we are usually taught about pagans being backward and superstitious mud eaters, lacking in sophistication and civilized advancements. Women thus held a high position in society and were involved in maintaining and overseeing the smooth progression of all aspects of social, family, economic, and religious life. Furthermore, these ancient goddess worship civilizations were matrilineal and matrilocal societies, which means that the bloodline was passed through the mother. Property and the family's wealth were passed down from mother to daughter. And in marriage, it was the man who came to live with the clan of the woman not the other way around. All of this shows that women held immense power in social life, although this does not mean that they dominated men. In other words, though today we live in a strict patriarchal system where men dominate women, in the Paleolithic and Neolithic goddess worship societies, men and women lived in egalitarian harmony and worked together in cooperative partnership. So just because it's patriarchy now doesn't mean back then it was matriarchy. It was these peaceful, nature-loving, and life-affirming agrarian societies ruled by women and feminine values that the northern Indo-European tribes and the Semitic Hebrew tribes from the south, specifically the Levite tribe of Moses and Aaron, who were part of the ruling priest class, invaded. The UCLA archeologist Maria Gambuta says, that these invasions took place in three waves and lasted anywhere between one and 3,000 years. The first signs of the stress caused by these invasions in the archeological record dates back to about 7,000 BC. Whereas the invasion of Canaan, modern day Palestine, by the Hebrew tribes occurred around 2000 to 1600 BC. Again, as these Northern and Southern tribes invaded, they encountered mainly agrarian societies that worshiped the female deity where the position of women was a position of power and autonomy. Also, they weren't really ready for war, you know, they didn't have war, they didn't have violence, so when these guys came rolling in, they got messy. So this short little synopsis of our prehistory should start to explain why the attack on femininity, women, and feminine values was so severe in the religious and political social orders that followed the goddess worship civilization right? Like, because you ask yourself, why? Why all the woman bashing? Well, it's because they were so powerful. If they weren't so powerful, there wouldn't be all this aggression against women wouldn't be necessary. It helps us, especially us women, to understand the extensive and organized attack more clearly and to identify the evidence of this systematic devaluing of the feminine in our religious doctrines and in our day-to-day -day social practices. So Rianne Eisler beautifully sums up the difference between the psychological and spiritual mentality governing the ancient goddess worship societies and the current monotheistic masculine dominated patriarchal societies by comparing their most ubiquitous religious iconography, right? So the images, their top religious image. For the goddess cultures, the most sacred religious image was that of a woman giving birth. For us, it's that of a man dying on a cross. Right. Yeah. Okay. Talk, talk about two. Yeah. <laughs> Eisler gives us two more images to clarify the sharp contrast between feminine and masculine gods. The female god is represented by the life giving chalice, while the masculine god is represented by the destructive and killing blade. The incoming invaders learned over time that domination by force would only go so far, since the worship of the goddess and the value systems based on that worship were so deeply integrated into the day-to-day -day lives of the people they conquered. A system consisting of propaganda and re-education mixed with force-backed domination was used to coerce our ancient ancestors to give up worshiping the goddess and start worshiping the new masculine god. Among these re-education stories is the most famous one of all, the Adam and Eve story. To understand how this story was told and disseminated, we have to understand that the Bible was written and rewritten several times over the course of millennia by a variety of priests 
first in Mesopotamia and Canaan, and later in the Hebrew kingdoms of Judea and Israel. The rewriting and remithing of the Bible was still going on as late as 400 BC. In fact, it was around 450 BC, as Brianne Eisler tells us, when, quote, in Palestine, the biblical mythology on which Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are still based was again sifted, edited, and added to by a group of Hebrew priests identified by biblical scholars as P or priestly school. This label was to distinguish them from earlier remithers, such as E or the Elohim school and J or the Yahweh school. These re-edits of the Bible, end quote, sorry. <laughs> These re-edits of the Bible were politically motivated. The Dartmouth Bible biblical scholars tell us that these Hebrew priests, quote, merged the J and E material, introducing much known as the P strand. The quantity and nature of this late contribution by the priestly authors surprised those unfamiliar with their work. It is thought to include nearly half of, of the Pentateuch. For many scholars ascribe to P, 11 chapters out of 50 in Genesis, 19 of the 40 in Exodus, 28 out of the 36 in Numbers, and the whole of Leviticus, end quote. They also dropped a great deal that was considered holy, like much of the Apocrypha, and ascribed divine origin to a variety of new ordinances to give them more weight. So they were like, oh yeah, you gotta do this. Yeah, God said, God said, you need to do it. <laughs> This explains all the inconsistencies and contradictions in the Bible, like the two differing origin stories of men and women. In the first, Adam and Eve are simultaneous divine creations, while in the second, Eve is created later out of Adam's rib. Eisler believes this inconsistency shows the ongoing tensions between the old and new religions. In their efforts to re-indoctrinate the people, Former images associated with the goddess had to be either reappropriated or discredited or both. It is in this context that the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden must be understood. The serpent, mainly in its ability to shed its skin and be reborn, represents the transformative power of the goddess and her awesome powers of regeneration. Joseph Campbell mentions that the serpent is at home in the depth under the trees, inside their roots, where it's quite watery and dark. Aspects and characteristics that are traditionally attributed to the feminine principle. Among the trees is also the location of our famous serpent in the Garden of Eden. Numerous myths and images from prehistoric to historic times connect the worship of the goddess and the ancient feminine religion with the serpent. Images that have been discovered in countless excavations. As Maria Gambutas observed, Quote, the snake and its abstract derivation, the spiral, are the dominant motifs of the art of old Europe. End quote. And actually, I, I did a presentation on just um, goddess serpent symbolism, and um, I have to put that on YouTube too, but I'll, I'll send you guys a link. And I don't think I put it in here, but I do want to say that one of the things that was done to discredit the serpent image was that over the course of a few thousand years, there were all these images and myths produced where some heroic masculine guy is killing and destroying a serpent or some kind of serpent. Yeah, you know, so it's yeah. like. Uh, it's just it, propaganda. Exactly. So <laughs> the Bible's just propaganda. Exactly. It's all political. <laughs> so, so this association of the goddess with the serpent accounts for the presence of the serpent in the Adam and Eve story in the first place. In fact, as Eisler says, this is the only way to look at this story. From the perspective of goddess worship traditions, the grove of sacred trees where access to divine wisdom and knowledge resides is the natural location for a woman priestess of the goddess, which is who Eve was. It is also perfectly natural for this woman to take her orders from the serpent i.e. from the goddess. The Garden of Eden itself is most likely an allusion to these earliest agrarian societies when men and women living in perfect bliss and harmony together created the first ever gardens. So 
So the image is a direct reference to these early Neolithic goddess worship cultures before the angry masculine sky god came along. What the remithers of biblical history did here was to repaint this serpent, the symbol of divine and oracular wisdom and feminine power, into an image of conniving and satanic evil, while Eve herself became a sexual temptress, hopelessly gullible for having taken Satan's word for it, and ultimately responsible for untold punishments that were ravaged thereafter upon women. For she was a priestess of the goddess who refused to stop worshiping her. To this day, countless people across the world believe in this story and live their lives according to its teachings. But I think it's time we began to really challenge this narrative. And the only way we can challenge it is by first learning the depth and breadth of the ongoing conspiracy to dominate, destroy, and discredit women. So we can conclude that the fall of humanity is really the men's fault. For they were the ones who destroyed and burned the beautiful gardens and brought death and destruction and murder and domination and division and hierarchy and slavery and war to an otherwise peaceful, life-affirming, and Edenic world. Thank you. <laughs> okay, wait, I'll do something else here. This is the end of part one of this lecture series. I imagine doing 12 of these lectures, maybe more, one every month until perhaps I have enough material for a short book, although better authors than myself have already thoroughly canvassed this material. If anything, my aim is to spread this knowledge that I am gaining at school so that everyday people might begin to see the extent to which we are all being hoodwinked by politically and economically motivated traditions and history and religion. My hope is that with, with more accurate knowledge, we can start making better decisions that are based in peace, harmony, cooperation, and freedom. The truth can motivate us to change our habits so we no longer blindly adhere to standards that support death and destruction. Like the ancient goddess-worshipping traditions, we must reorient our attitudes so that a sacred reverence of life is the highest priority. When we get to this level of self-awareness, we will naturally stop mentally, emotionally, and financially supporting systems of death and destruction. As with all meaningful transformations, it begins inside of us. And don't forget to dance. <laughs> don't forget to dance. Or as my friend Ray, yeah, we all know. No. She saying, say, remember to dance. She says remember it's more. To dance. Okay, thank you. I like don't forget to dance. <laughs> and then you can play that song. Yeah. The kinks. So actually, it's the kinks. Um, I, what I do is I do these sermons on Sunday mornings. These verbal sermons. Do you do them live? Um, I no, I don't. I just record them well I write them and then okay. I record them and okay. I've been uploading them on my website what I'm going to do now that I have the sound system at home is I'm going to record a musical set and I'm going to have like a dance party set that goes with the, that week's sermon and then you can listen to it do, I do your have your own dance party yeah right? yeah it. so because I have a ton of music That's and I'm just going to make like an hour I'm just going to record a set and then oh, uh, yeah because uh that way you can be like, listen to the sermon, and then you can close your eyes and dance for a while, and, and, and hopefully let some of the stuff I talk about kind of sink in, and, and um, maybe um, you know, we can start to challenge our own belief systems. Because I think the problem is we all constantly want to um, go outside of ourselves to find solutions to problems. But I actually really think each person has to kind of transform themselves mm -hmm. first. If we ever want to kind of maybe mm -hmm. stop with all the crazy wars and all the destruction that's going on. But anyway, anybody have any questions? Comments? I've never heard the um, comparing the snake in the Garden of Good and Evil to like um, a goddess before, so that was interesting. I've never heard that before. So yeah, um, well, the even even Jesus is really lifted from something else. Yeah. it's all lifted yeah. from the ancient religions that happened there. It's all pro it was propaganda written yeah. to discredit yeah. 
what was already remain what was already, what was already, already there. Yeah. yeah because exactly. people wouldn't stop people in fact i haven't i haven't actually i have to sit down and actually read the bible it's 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 in my future but um from these writers i gather that there's constantly these different prophets who are like stop worshiping these other gods this is the god and it's yeah. like an ongoing thing because people keep still worshiping yes. the because the worship mm -hmm. of the goddess was so prevalent for so many thousands of years yeah. that people couldn't just you know turn it off like that. So, Did they and even Jesus was very pro woman. He yeah. I haven't gotten yeah. to the Jesus chapter in there yet, but there's a whole chapter in there where he, there's all this evidence of how he was like yeah. basically mm -hmm. a peace loving right. kind yeah. of dude, right. and, yeah. and, and, right. yet, and yet none of that. They, they twist it somehow. Totally. <laughs> Oh, gotcha. Yeah, somehow yeah. Jesus hates fags. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know how that happened. From, yeah. Because I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure there was at least one gay guy among the 12 disciples. Had to be. Statistically, I mm -hmm. think maybe even three. <laughs> Did they call a goddess as they worshipped anything? Or was it multiple yes, goddesses? Yes, or was it one okay, goddess? So there's like a million it? different names yeah. for okay. her all okay. over from, from different, um, different, um, I have, yeah, I have my, my notes. Where yes. you were in the right. world, too. Right. Right. Yeah. Because it was Regions. different everywhere. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like, I think Egyptians sometimes it was had ambiguous. Egyptians had names. And, had names. Right. Um, and, and, and there right. are tons of goddesses. But she always had the same in, underlying in the qualities, I would imagine. Yeah, the idea like, is that she's basically the same goddess. She just kind of called a different thing because there was so much goddess worship all across, all of, pretty much no. the whole planet. There, there were all these goddess worshiping cultures. In fact, I think there's one line in the in the Quran where he's like, um, "Allah will not put up with this idolatry." And then they they put like some ellipses, and it says, "The pagans worship females." Right. Yeah. So, so there's evidence, like even in their own holy books, books. Mm -hmm. to uh, to the to the goddess. clues. The, yeah. clues. In the Bible, the what's the I can't think of the other word, but it, the derivative today is Beelzebub. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was something that starts with a B. Baal. 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 Mm -hmm. And that was an ancient female uh, uh, goddess. Yes, right. That that and they they, they turned it into the devil. Right. Yeah. So so even even like horned horned yeah. um, uh, bulls mm -hmm. was a, was an image of the goddess, and mm -hmm. that's how we got Satan because right. they basically Part appropriated of, yeah. that image mm -hmm. and made it evil. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 much of it has has to do with this, and I think it's kind of I think uh, you know. Um, a lot, of, a lot of people aren't aware of all this. Yeah. Certainly it's not around these new parts. to me. It's yeah. very uh, infuriating. <laughs> yeah. Like when you read first read this, it's infuriating. Right. Like yeah. I think something else to be on. Try yeah. To stay calm. I know. Me too. <laughs> but I mean, it's like it's I think it's necessary. It's a rite of passage. Yeah. It's a yeah. rite of passage uh, yeah. from one state yeah. of consciousness to yeah. the next. Well, so, and yeah. then once you work through it, you can find something on the other side. I would imagine. Hopefully. I'm still in my rage. I think I think even in in in, in any uh, like in any kind of ending of a um, of a belief system that has been like held dear for a long time, or even when you break up with someone, there's a period of anger, right? Sure. As you yeah. as you because there's this like you're psychologically reorienting yourself to a whole bunch of new stuff, and that's very difficult. You know, mm -hmm. the psyche doesn't really like. It doesn't jive with change very well. The deep psyche doesn't like change, so uh, it's 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 disruptive, and anger hides fear. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's that's really what it is. Directly related. So I'm going well, thank to you. turn this off. Thank you. Because you're not going to really right. to do this.